Hi. This is part two of uh, two videos on how to use for loops. And so just as a reminder, for loops are a way of automating code. And so what I'm going to show is a way of automating code and utilizing a for loop to do an analysis, do an analysis of a set of data. Um, so with that, um, let me get started. So the first thing is to create the input data. So right here, I've used a function called set.seed. Uh, that's going to make this next line of code not as random as it should be. So uh, this is sample. So it's like meant to randomly sample data, but I want you to be able to follow along. And so this makes it so that it is randomly sampling data, but like the algorithm is based on this number that just got generated. And so it's going to be predictably random. So if you do set.seed1 and then you run li this line of code, you will get this same output vector of kind of randomly scrambled values. This next line of code is kind of the tricky part of this demonstration, that I am creating empty objects, so using null, I am what we call instantiating them. And I, I do actually have a um, a, val a version of this script that is shared on this page that contains alternative uh, uh, instructions that contain more comments. So if, you, if you're wanting to read more about what's happening, you can go use that version. I've simplified a little bit here just so that it's easier for you to look at on the screen. So I've created these empty objects through a process called instantiation, um, and that's going to allow me to manipulate them later on. Now, it turns out this is not the preferred way to do it, um, but honestly, I've used it a lot because whenever you're kind of just testing code, and especially when you're first learning, um, it, it can be easy to use this method. But basically, the strategy I'm going to do is each round of the loop, it's going to just add some stuff onto the ends. So right now, if I add anything onto the end of it, that just means it will have a length one or one unit, at least, whatever that unit is. And then each round, I'm just going to keep adding more and more on. And so I'll show you that code. To do this, I am running kind of a complicated for loop. I will tell you that this is my most common syntax for running a for loop. I create an object, usually an object that is somehow descriptive, um, that's related to like iteration. So like you'll see me use chromosome iter, which stands for chromosome iteration, or like C-H-R-I-T-E-R. -E Here I've just done I, because it's standing for the iterated value. And what I mean by iterated is just a fancy word for meaning that it, it changes each time. In this case, even though vec is, or vec2 is all kinds of like random numbers, I want to keep track of where in the loop I am. Am I on the first round, the second round, the third round? When should it end? Well, it should end at the end of vec2, whenever we've reached the last value. And so what I've said here is instead of like just saying in the, the previous video, I had something that looks like this. I don't want i to be each value of vec2. I want i to be the position within vec2 that I currently want to analyze, starting at the first row. And then this is kind of like through. It's a function, technically. Um, the end, so the length of vec1, which is 20, because I generated 20 values. Put together, that actually is just this object, 1 through 20, each of those values. And because of order of operations, it turns out in occurs very late because oh, I'm not the only one who likes this syntax for a for loop. In occurs very late within the order of operations. And so what R sees is that I is in 1 through 20. It doesn't see I is in this code somehow. This code gets interpreted first, and then that's what I gets set to. So for the first round of the loop, I will be set to the uh, first value in this object altogether, which is one. Second round of the loop, it will be two and three. When I said this video was about an advanced strategy, that's what I mean by a strategy. I could have written this in a lot of different ways. And given the simplicity of the, the loop, 
There's a lot of different ways I could have written it. But this is a strategy that is very um, broadly applicable, and I use it constantly. In fact, I very almost always regret <laughs> structuring a for loop like this. Um, and that's because it's usually very important for me to know the position within the for loop that I'm at. And so this is kind of my go-to method. So let's break it down. So if I try to run this right now, this won't work. Think about why it won't work. You learned about it in the last video. Hopefully, you guessed that it's that I doesn't exist. We need I in order for this to work, but the for loop is where I gets created. And so what people will do is they'll try to run this, and they'll be like, Dr. Bentley, it's not working. There's no I. How do I get I? It's like, guys, interpret your for loop. So I is going to be set equal to whatever's to the right of here. And so for the first round of the loop, I will be set to one. So I just type that down at the bottom. I don't really want to store the code because whenever I do run the for loop, it will create I. Um, I don't have to worry about that, but for testing code, for like debugging, what I often do, because I make a lot of mistakes, I'm a biologist, I'm not necessarily a computer scientist, I go through and I will manually set that iterated value to the position that I'm kind of concerned about, and I'll run my code across that position. So that's what I've just done. I've set i equal to one, and now I can test my code x became four, because four is the first value in vec2. y is purely based on x. It's based on x minus five squared. So four minus five is negative one, negative one squared is one. Finally, it's going to combine the out vec which right now, um, we never ran that code. Boop, boop, okay. Out vec, which is currently nothing. That's what null is standing for. Um, when we combine them, it's going to just stick that y onto the end, so the first position becomes the new y value. So this is me showing how in a for loop, I could, and let me just kind of end the loop here and just comment out this code, I could store the value within that object. And so every round, it did this extraction from vec2. It said, all right, here's my current x. Then it said, all right, here's my current y based on x. Finally, it took the previous round of out vec and it added y to the end. In fact, if I rerun this with a print command inside, I can watch that happen in real time. So let me reset out vec and let me add a sys.sleep in order to help us visualize. I'm gonna make that 0 0.1 so it's not too fast, too slow. So each time it runs, that vector became bigger and bigger and bigger until the final round when it was all of the values of y after that um, analysis. So that's it, like that's the concept. It's, it's really handy, it's very fast to implement once you kind of wrap your head around it. Um, and, and it's a really good way for you to learn some of this coding. Um, but I did want to show you what if you wanted to run a matrix. So um, what if I wanted to store more than just Y? Like I'd say, I want to know in all one big matrix what is I, so what version of the loop am I on, what's X and what is Y? In that case, we can save this to a matrix. So what this does, and I've written kind of a fancy line of code, is that it's going to combine i, x, and y into a single vector. So if I, if I order of operations working from the inside out, that is just going to be 28 and 9 right now. It's then going to call out mat, Actually, it's also going to call out mat, which is currently null. And R bind stands for row bind. It's going to try to bind this new value. So here's the first matrix. It's going to try to bind them together. 
To do that, it's going to have to convert this into a matrix because um, of the way R works, this will end up just kind of creating rows and rows of I, X, Y, depending on how many rounds of the loop it runs. And so if I, I guess I can print it again, out mat, and we'll do another sys.sleep. This one will be a little harder to read, so I'll do it in a full second. So there's the first round, second round, there's two rows, third round, fourth round, and so on. So here, we're just taking x, y, x, yeah, i, x, and y, sticking them together into a vector, and then binding them on one row at a time. And so by the time we get to the end, we now have the full matrix. And what's cool is I can use that. I can, I've now organized the output of my analysis. I can plot it. Uh, this is actually a kind of a, a fancy plot where I have in plotted it as an empty data, and then because I wanted to show the use of that I, I've then um, plotted text that shows where each value was, which is good because um, what we learned, or what we did at the beginning, was scramble all the numbers up. So these numbers are the position within the matrix versus the X value at that position in the matrix. And if that didn't make sense, go play with this code yourself. So finally, I just wanted to show that there is a better way of doing this. Uh, th there are a lot of reasons why this is a better way, but one of the reasons why is that for really large data, um, every time you add another row, that's, it's difficult to operate the memory that way. And, and in fact, by the time you get to the end, you have a much larger object than you had at the beginning. Um, and so what can help is to instantiate the object as an empty object, but containing the amount of space, essentially, that it will eventually require. So that's what I've done here. I've used a matrix function, which I don't have time to cover in this video, but I've used a matrix function to create an empty, so missing in values across a certain number of rows, across a certain number of columns, corresponding to the data I want to put into that matrix. So if I run that line of code and I print it, it's just a bunch of missing data points. But it's structured a lot like that previous out mat. So here I do the exact same um, process. I, I create i, I loop it from one through the end of the vector. I extract during each round the ith value of vec1. I run my analysis on it. Here I've manipulated it so it makes a different graph. And then here, I've used something uh, from the filtering and object manipulation uh, tutorials to actually insert that data into the current row. And that's where the real beauty is, is that because I use this more complicated strategy of writing the for loop, I could easily determine where did that information belong and put it in the correct position. And that's what's happening here. I'm, I'm using this extraction function to extract the ith row, and then I'm sticking that information into the ith row. And so if I run this, you don't really see anything. Um, I could print it off each time. And I could sleep. And let me reset out mat, because that's always a challenge. People will forget to kind of reset these objects. I will usually use like an if statement somewhere in here to kind of create this object instead of creating it outside, but this works for now. So I've created my object. It's currently no information. I'm gonna make this bigger because it's a pretty big matrix. And then ooh, it's real big. It's really hard to do. All right, so now I'm gonna press Control Enter while on the beginning of my for loop, and that should allow the code to run. And so watch what happens in the console. First round, second round, third round, fourth round, just each time it's adding in the new row that's replacing those old missing values and filling in our matrix as we go. And so it's almost done. Once it's done, we can um, use that information, we can call it. Um, if I look at out mat, 
Oh, that's the original out map. Let me make this. I can plot this. Nope, sorry, this is just the wrong section at all. I can plot that information, and you'll see I flipped the sign of the, the multiplier, but that's it. So that's our complicated for loop. Uh, really, the next step is to start nesting them, but that will be for a different video. So thank you. I hope that helped. Um, please reach out if you're still struggling because those for loops are so powerful and they're so useful um, as you're starting to learn this, this new field. So thank you. Have a good day.